This is a church of pioneers, past, present, and yet to come. The stories of only a few are portrayed in this film as representative of the thousands, some remembered, many forgotten, who unselfishly have devoted their lives and all they had to building the kingdom of God on earth. To me, it has always been a thing of wonder at a time when our people were struggling to establish themselves in these mountain valleys, they put the spread of the gospel ahead of everything else. They set aside every other consideration, the comfort and well-being of their families, their own peace and security, to go abroad to preach the gospel of the risen Lord. Across the broad prairie between the mountains of the West and the Missouri and Mississippi rivers, there were two bodies of Latter-day Saints moving in opposite directions. Missionaries traveling to the eastern states in Europe passed converts gathering from those lands to the Zion of the West. There was likewise a movement to the West Coast and across the Pacific, with elders going to Hawaii, even to China, Siam, Ceylon, and India. This was all part of a grand vision of an ensign to the nations. It has gone on ever since, and it goes on today at an accelerated pace. The church has been moving out across the world in a remarkable and wonderful way. And the story of its growth and expansion is the story of God moving in his majesty and power. Those who have labored in this great effort have not been engaged in an ordinary cause. It is the cause of Christ. It is veritably the plan and work of God, our eternal Father. It has to do with all of his children. It is an end sign to the nations, a sign that God is at work in this world, gathering his people and preparing them for the second coming of his Son. In April of 1834, I arrived, a newly baptized member in Kirtland, Ohio. It was the first time I had ever seen the prophet Joseph Smith. We met in the street, and he invited me home with him. The next evening, the prophet called on all who held the priesthood to gather into a little log schoolhouse. It was small, perhaps 14 feet square but it held the whole of the priesthood of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who were then in Kirtland. That was the first time I ever saw Oliver Cowdery or heard him speak. The first time I ever saw Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball. The prophet called upon those present to bear testimony of this work. Those I have named spoke, as well as many others. When they got through, the prophet said, Brethren, I have been very much edified by your testimonies here tonight, but I want to say to you before the Lord that you know no more concerning the destinies of this church and kingdom than a babe upon its mother's lap. You don't comprehend it. It is only a little handful of priesthood you see here tonight, but this church will fill North and South America. It will fill the world. On Sunday, the 4th of June, 1837, the Prophet Joseph came to me while I was seated above the sacrament table in the Kirtland Temple, and in a whisper said, Brother Heber, the Spirit of the Lord has whispered to me, let my servant Heber go to England and proclaim my gospel and open the door of salvation to that nation. The idea was overwhelming. However, the moment I understood the will of my Heavenly Father, I felt a determination to go at all hazards. And although my family was dear to me and I should have to leave them almost destitute, 
I felt that the cause of truth, the gospel of Christ, outweighed every other consideration. On July 1st, 1837, Heber C. Kimball and six companions boarded the packet ship Garrett and set sail on the first overseas mission of this dispensation. Three weeks later, the Garrick docked at Liverpool, main port of what was then the most powerful nation on earth. Feeling impressed to travel north to Preston, the missionaries were invited to address the congregation of Reverend James Fielding, brother of one of Heber's companions, Joseph Fielding. Vauxhall Chapel was filled to capacity on Sunday, July 23rd, as Elder Kimball arose and declared that an angel had returned to earth with the fullness of the everlasting gospel. He spoke on faith, repentance, baptism, and gave a brief history of the work which the Lord had commenced in the latter days. Orson Hyde then arose and bore his testimony. In his journal, Heber recorded, it had a great effect on the congregation. They cried, glory to God, to think that the Lord had sent his servants to them. <laughs> Reverend Fielding invited them to speak again that evening and then again the following Wednesday. The people paid the most profound attention, recorded Joseph Fielding. Elder Kimball wrote, the power of God rested down on the congregation and many were pricked to the heart. Nine requested baptism. Early on the morning of Sunday, July 30th, the missionaries and their converts walked to the banks of the River Ribble. Large numbers of people were strolling through a nearby park, and when word spread that a baptismal service was taking place, an estimated seven to 9,000 gathered to watch. That initial mission of elders Heber C. Kimball and Orson Hyde uh, was amazing. Uh, in the period of about nine months, uh, approximately 1,600 uh, converts came into the church in and around Preston, England. They developed an incredible love and affection and trust and confidence in, the, in these apostles who were in England at the time. My great-grandfather uh, joined the church in Switzerland in 1856, and then he came over here in 1861 with a group of Swiss saints. And he said at uh, one time that one of the reasons he, he had come was because he wanted for himself and his family the society of apostles and prophets. Thousands upon thousands came into the church in the uh, late 1840s and early 1850s to the extent that uh, by 1851 there were over 30,000 members of the church in Great Britain alone within the uh, boundaries of the British mission. 31,000, think of that, that's twice as many as there were in the United States and Canada combined at that time. Some said, well, they're just picking up a lot of the riffraff. But when Charles Dickens goes down, I think it's in the 1860s, when the Amazon is getting ready to leave and Dickens says some wonderful things as he goes and talks to these people. He's surprised about them. He's uh, how orderly they are, how, how, what good sturdy people they are. And he said, this is not riffraff. This is the pick and flower of England. From Britain, the preaching of the gospel expanded into continental Europe. Between 1840 and 1888, under the direction of the First Presidency, the gospel was introduced in 15 European nations. And while converts were made in each of these countries, proselyting in 19th century Europe was risky and difficult. In spite of those challenges, uh, the missionaries really never gave up. Denmark uh, had a rich harvest of souls uh, over the period of the next two decades, 1850 through 1870. Then after 1870, uh, religious freedom entered into Norway and Sweden and the church grew. The Scandinavian mission was the second most powerful mission next to the British mission. It's hard to overstate the uh, value of these European converts for the church. They provided the church with the people on which the kingdom was built and, on the other hand, that built the kingdom. After touring the missions of Europe in 1862, 
Elder George Q. Cannon, himself a convert from England, wrote, From every nation where the gospel is being preached, the Lord is assembling a people whom he will yet make the mightiest power that has ever had an existence on the earth.